methodologies which other people have used. So you can find, for example, the five most highly cited papers in a particular field, look at what they've done and how can that inform your research? How can you take those methodologies and apply it to your work? That then becomes useful. That then becomes a resource for other people. So, you have to filter. Okay, there's no way that you can read everything that's ever published. There will always be gaps in the knowledge, there will always be things you don't know, there will always be studies you haven't read. And so, you have to reduce the number of papers that you're working with in order to make it manageable, in order to make it useful. And the best way to do that is to focus on the very highest quality papers. So if you're reading quite broadly around your subject, why would you start with anything but the best? So when you look at the search results from Google Scholar or whatever you use, look at the number of citations. So if a paper is five years old and it's been cited three or four hundred times, it's probably pretty important you should probably read it. On the other hand, if it's 20 years old and it's only been cited five times, and those five times were by the author of the original paper, it's probably not that important. It might be. And you can always have a look, but the chances are, you know, you can cut out a lot of hard work just by doing an initial level of filtering by the number of citations. Because other academics in your field have already judged its quality. So you can save yourself a huge amount of time. Also, focus on the most relevant. So, if you do a general search, you will get hundreds or thousands of papers. And so, you have to focus on the very best. But when you narrow the search right the way down to your specific niche, there may be only three or four research groups worldwide, or less, doing something very, very similar to what you do. And in that case, it's possible for you to read everything that they've written, ever. If you pick the top three experts in your field, read everything they've written, within a very short space of time, you can become the number four expert in the world. Because if there's nobody else doing it, and you've read everything that those guys have done, then you're already up there, you have that level of knowledge. So by narrowing the search, then you can have a much greater impact, and you can develop that expertise much, much faster, rather than just trying to read everything, because that's, frankly, that's not PhD level thinking. No, you just focus on the numbers. So think about why you're using the literature and try and find a more intelligent approach. Okay. So, PhD is all about research, so what is the nature of research? So, the aim is to go beyond what is already known. And this is one of the reasons why most people do a PhD. It's kind of a romantic image of working at the frontier of human knowledge and feeling that um, by contributing something back, that your work has meaning and impact. And that's very attractive, that's why people get into it. But because you're going beyond what's already known, you cannot know the outcome. If you know the outcome of your research in advance, it's not research. Or it's not interesting research anyway, because it's not contributing anything that was, that was unexpected. It's not contributing anything beyond the obvious. And it's often in the surprises that the most interesting research emerges. So, a uh, quick question. Uh, does anybody recognize this guy? Okay. Uh, so no pharmacists in the room? <laughs> uh, okay, so this is uh, Alexander Fleming. Mm -hmm. uh, he discovered penicillin. Mm -hmm. So does anybody know the story of this, the discovery of penicillin? Anybody? <laughs> I hope so. Sorry? I know something about it. Okay, what, what do you know? What's what accidental? It was in the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. And he was researching uh, something with food, mm. then he saw that there was um, something that was killing bacteria in the food. Yeah. Okay. And that was this. So maybe that's the thing. Okay. Okay. So that's <coughs> kind of what most people know. Um, first of all, most people know that it's accidental. And then something to do with mold and mold killing bacteria and penicillin. But there's, there's obviously a little bit more to it than that. So what he was doing. Uh, he was trying to grow uh, cultures of bacteria in petri dishes, and he um, put, put them 
him away in the corner of his lab. Um, he was notoriously untidy, uh, probably like myself when I was doing lab work. Um, although I never won the Nobel Prize. Um, <laughs> and never will. Um, uh, he went away for the weekend, and uh, I think it was three or five dishes that he had. And one of them, which hadn't been sealed properly, um, he noticed that there were spots of mold growing in the, in the bacterial culture. Now, what most people would do in that situation is think, oh, it's ruined, it's contaminated, throw it away. That's what, mo that's what most people's reaction would be. But what he noticed was that around the spots of mold, there were small areas where the bacteria hadn't grown. And so, rather than throwing it away, because he was a good researcher, he thought, huh, why is that happening? So he figured that there must be some chemical substance which was being given off by the mold, which was killing bacteria. And the key point of it is not that... <laughs> the key point of it is not the accident. The key point is that when something unexpected happened, rather than throwing it away, or rather than getting frustrated, he became curious. And not only that, but he also had the skill to figure out what was going on. So the accident was only the starting point. It's not A, B, C, oh, something's gone wrong, penicillin. It's all the work which happened afterwards, and it's his response to the unexpected, which was key, and which ultimately resulted in antibiotics, and which less significantly won him the Nobel Prize. So, if we go back to the uh, standard advice that I put up at the beginning, if what you focus on is the target and the deadline in your to-do list, then it makes you so focused on a particular outcome that when something unexpected happens, it's, it's a failure. And you cannot do great research if all you focus on is the original target and the deadline. You do need these things, because they give you direction, they give you some structure. But you also need that flexibility to um, respond with curiosity when unexpected things happen. And it's often in the unexpected things the most interesting results come up. Okay. Because obviously, you know, the most interesting stuff is always unexpected, because it's not obvious. So, if you just follow this, you will not do great research. So you need flexibility in the system, you need different approaches at different times, you need to respond in a different ways to the So, if you start with a target and a deadline, so obviously this gives you a bit of structure, it gives you direction. There are two possible outcomes. You either succeed or you fail. If you succeed, you're great. You know, but it's inevitable that at some point something will go wrong because you can't predict the outcome of research. So what do you do then? Do you just go back to this point and set a new deadline? And this is what a lot of people try to do. You know, just keep going, keep going, keep going until it's done. But a far a more effective approach is to switch on your curiosity. So, whenever something fails, it's absolutely essential to think, to stop and think, why is that happening? Why am I not getting the result that I expected? Okay. Is it a failure or is it is there actually something interesting behind it? Okay. And it's only if you do this that you can switch on your problem solving and creative skills, which are essential to research. So, if you're focused on a target and a deadline, the assumption is that you go in a straight line. So, um, you know where you are in a moment, you know where you want to be, you know roughly how long it's going to take. But there's this unknown space in the middle. Unless you've got a very well established methodology, then you can never quite predict what's going to happen in between the starting point and the finish point. Inevitably, you will hit a block. If you do research for long enough, you know, or not even very long, you will hit a block sooner or later, usually sooner. And if you're focused just